launch party for a three-week celebration, and it is also much more. Some of you have already picked up your invitations in the back of the church, and I thank you for that. To the others, I invite you to grab one. They are alphabetical, or our best attempt at alphabetical. Uh, so good luck. If you don't find your name, please sign that little green sheet and take an envelope from the back because all are invited. This is not a private party. This is not a closed invitation. It is a warm, open, wide open welcome invitation to each and every one of you. As you take your invitations, I ask that you take a moment to see what else is in the box. It is a statue from my grandmother's bookcase. It is the thinker. Do any of you know that statue, the guy hanging out there? To be honest, when we prepared all the invitations to the stewardship committee this week, they were not enough to fill the box, and we needed something to help them stand up straight. But as I started thinking about the thinker, I realized that he is a perfect visual reminder to us that these invitations are not just your standard annual stewardship letter asking for some kind of pledge of money. These invitations are also intensely personal and globally and locally important. So we will take some time today to consider the global effects of God's invitation to us all to enter into wholehearted generosity. That is the phrase that kept coming up in my heart as I thought about this season, as I thought about what we wanted to invite you to in this church, in this town, in this place and time. And I hope and I pray along with the Stewardship Committee and the Finance Committee that you will decide to join our party, that you will pray about it, that you will think about it, and discern God's will for your life. And whatever you choose, whatever you and God decide together, if you are faithful, it will bring honor and glory to the Lord. The dollar amount is never the main thing. And that's what I love about this time of year, this event. Some of you know that I uh, tend to enjoy shaking people up at times. I like to say surprising things that invite you into a new way of experiencing God or thinking about your life and your faith. And in seminary, I had some colleagues who said they hate this season of the church. They hate talking about money in church, and they have developed elaborate campaigns never to use the word stewardship because it's such a dirty and ugly and off-putting word. They, they think it's crass to talk about money in church or tacky. And when my friends in seminary told me that, I asked them if they had ever read the New Testament. <laughs> you know, we call ourselves Christians because we attempt to emulate or follow the life and example of a historical man that we call the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And if you read the accounts that we have about his life and his ministry, he spoke a lot <coughs> about money and about how we use our resources. God has blessed us with so many resources today, and we are called to be good stewards of all of our gifts and graces, including our money, our time, and our energy. So I hope that I don't make you too uncomfortable today or in the next few weeks as we take a biblical approach to the importance of wholehearted generosity. I found this morning's psalm a perfect introduction to the topic. The earth and everything on it belong to the Lord. The world and its people belong to him. We can make schedules, create budgets, develop intricate envelope-based <coughs> cash flow plans, and even balance our checkbooks down to the penny. But we are fooling ourselves if we think that our money is our own. Sure, we may have worked to earn it, or some of it, but who gave us the ability to work, the skills, and the help necessary to earn money? The country in which we live, where personal ownership and independence are highly regarded values. In some countries, women and children are still seen as property. Governments seize assets. And even information that we consider private like our banking information or our health care, 
are collected and overseen by people in power. As we come to the Lord's table this morning on World Communion Sunday, I invite you to ponder what your life would be like if you had been born in China or in Northern Africa or in Southeast Asia. Would you be a follower of Christ? How about in one of the many countries where girls are still not allowed to pursue an education or are forced to walk miles through dangerous deserts to haul fresh water back to their families? Child labor is still alive and well in many places, as are many other injustices and violence of many kinds. All you have to do is turn on the radio or the television to see that that is true. And all of these forms of violence and injustice, they horrify the God who created us all to be his beloved <coughs> children. Anytime we say that God's love is more for me and those like me than it is for those over, the, over there, for those others, or for those who look differently than me, or act differently than me, or believe differently than me, we are weakening the power and the witness of the testimony of the one true and living God. You see, we are blessed to live where we live, to worship where we worship, even as imperfect as our church and the other churches in our area and our country continue to be. And yet so few Americans take advantage of the opportunity to come into the presence of holiness each week. They might think about living a more connected or more peaceful life, but rolling out of bed on a Sunday morning when they could go for a hike or a ski or a golf game or a round of bottomless mimosas, that is obviously asking too much. But look back at the psalmist's words. Who may climb the Lord's hill or stand in his holy temple? Only those who do right for the right reasons. And don't worship idols or tell lies under oath. Okay, the psalmist doesn't say that you need to attend church, but I contend that if you worship the living God in a church where others have a tendency to call you out if you do something wrong, or you do something right for the wrong reasons, or you lie, or you worship idols like ego or success or money, if you are part of a community of Christ, then I think you are way more likely to be worthy of approaching God on a hill or a temple. It's that community aspect of the early church. It's that community aspect of the modern church that keeps our eyes on the main thing, which just to be clear, is Jesus Christ not any of the other issues that we choose to make the main thing. Keeping our eyes focused on Jesus is what keeps us moving forward and doing good work in this world, even when we disagree. And today's text is clear. If we serve and worship the Lord, then God will be faithful to save us from ourselves, to bless us abundantly with unimaginable goodness, and to reward us with delights that we could never deserve. The God of love is faithful and just, and when we give our trust, our hope, and our lives to him, he responds by pouring out abundant blessings in our lives. When someone told me once that she was joining our church, I said, woohoo, that is so exciting. And she said, that's not exciting at all. We've been going here for years. <laughs> and I said to her, well, it's exactly for that reason that I think it's exciting. Because even though you've been coming here for ages, and you know you fit in here, and you know we love you, God has still called you and invited you to make a deeply personal leap of faith and to publicly join this body of believers and to commit to an institution that we all can agree is imperfect and filled with imperfect people. What a testimony that you know us and yet you still choose to love us and to join us. You should have seen the surprise on her face. 
It's the same surprise I see on my own children's faces when they act out uh, and rather than respond in anger, I wrap them in my arms. This is not every time, by the way, but, but when I can manage to respond, not in anger, but to wrap them in my loving arms and say, I see you, and I kiss them on the head, and I explain why what they did was wrong and why it hurt. You can see them melt. You can see that ball of hard anger and frustration and temper melt. It's a tiny example of the way that we love so imperfectly, even though we are loved perfectly. And we can barely recognize or accept true mercy and grace when we see it. Sometimes we run away from that kind of deep, authentic, messy, but steadfast love and support and encouragement. But I assure you, even when we run from Jesus and from one another, that God's love is still here and it is alive and well among us. From baptizing a little baby here a few weeks ago to hearing the parents of two or three other kids who would like to baptize their children, God is here. From holding newborn baby Dylan Fagan in my arms this week to clutching an 88-year-old woman's hand as I prayed for her frustration at facing the end of her life, Jesus Christ is among us. From signing and sealing over 130 invitations to our stewardship committee laying hands on and praying over your letters, the Holy Spirit is upon us. I and the finance committee and stewardship committee, and in fact, all of the leaders of this church, whether they are financial or not, we invite you this morning to deepen your commitment to the wider global world that is so desperately in need of God's redemption and salvation. An invitation, which we will discuss next Sunday, to make a difference in our local community and church. And finally, an invitation that we'll consider two weeks from now, which is deeply personal, that can make all the difference for you in your own life if you step out of your comfort zone, fill in your RSVP card, and make a public profession of a private commitment in terms of your financial gifts, but also in terms of your prayers, your presence, your service, and your witness through this local church. A finance chairman once told me that there is one thing I could never say from the pulpit, and you know me. That makes me want to say it all the more, and here it is. God and the church do not need our money. God will accomplish God's goals on this planet, with or without us, just as we find in the book of Esther. But we need to give our money and ourselves. We need to plug in, to get connected, to be healed so that we can heal and share God's love with one another. Listen to the psalmist. Open the ancient gates and any closed or hardened parts of your own heart. Open the ancient gates so that the glorious King may come in. He is our Lord, the all-powerful. And through His mighty power, God can redeem us, change us, soften us, and even heal us. He can create in us a new way of believing, of seeing ourselves and the world around us. And it may not change overnight. It may not change, but we we can surely change in an instant. And as we prepare to enter into the sacrament of Holy Communion this morning, I invite an usher to please go downstairs and welcome our children back up so they can join us as they were so eager to eat the bread from the very beginning of our time together this morning. I invite us all to take a few moments in silence and to prepare ourselves and our hearts to receive God's love through the body and blessing of this sacrament. Let us confess together 